Um, Matt, you know, appreciate you taking the, the time. My pleasure. What a career you've had. From a young age, successful actor, you made the jump to director, television, theater, movies, and now you have Cut Bank. Uh, l let me see here. You have Bruce Stern, uh, Oliver Pat, uh, Billy Bob Thornton, John Malkovich, uh, Liam Halsworth, and Teresa Palmer. Right. Uh, now let me ask, what was your technique when you approached the cast that has what roughly around 200 plus years in Hollywood? <laughs> yeah, with humility, obviously. <laughs> uh, as uh, I, I'm a theater guy, as you mentioned, so um, I, I reached out to a lot of fellow theater actors. Uh, John Malkovich was the first guy to come on board, and I'm a huge fan of his work with Steppenwolf and the other theater um, projects he's been involved with over the years. And you know, I, I kind of approach working with actors in theater and TV and film in the same way, which is just to, to speak about story. And, and you know, I, I, having been an actor before, I, I know what they're going through, so I, I, I try to approach it uh, as much as I can from their point of view. And, and then, you know, also these guys are unbelievably talented, so uh, a lot of it is about like, getting out of their way and letting them do what they do so well. It's amazing because, you know, when I was looking at the cast and, you know, your career yourself, you know, you're no shrinking violet. You, you, you've come from a, you know, a wonderful background. Had you known many of the actors? Actually, no. Um, I hadn't met uh, any of them before except for Oliver Platt, who I worked with um, many years ago on a show called Huff on Showtime. Um, the others were, were all new to me, um, but I was an enormous fan of all of them and, and pursued them doggedly to try to get them on board uh, and, uh, and then got to, to, you know, get to know them uh, personally uh, when I had already known their work professionally. Talking about a, a dream team, a dream cast come together. When it all finally was said and done, did you think to yourself, wow, how did I do this? How, how did this all happen? <laughs> Yeah, definitely, absolutely, and it was a it was a slow process. You know, it, it began. Uh, it took a couple of years to to, to, to gather those guys and, and bring them together and find a time when they could all um, meet in Edmonton to shoot the film. Uh, and you know, first the first person on board, I, I have to really thank is John Malkovich, and I think you know his his involvement um, really helped um, encourage others to be involved. Um, you know, who who comes to the party first is. It's always important, and uh, and he he decided that this was something he wanted to do, and, and he stayed with it for years. It took us that, you know that long to kind of get it together. Uh, so bless his heart. Uh, I'm a huge fan of him, uh, you know, as an actor, but uh, as big a fan of him as a person because he really helped make this movie happen. Yeah, you know, you know the, the the story you know talking about the film is it's fascinating because it's it's about a young guy who just wants more for his life. That idea we can all relate to. I, I, I grew up in Ventura, as we talked about earlier, which, is a, which was, when I was growing up, a very, very small town. Now it feels like it's been annexed uh, by Santa Barbara and Los Angeles, yes. California, and you would know what I mean, yes. and the world has spread. Um, but, uh, you know, I can relate to that, you know, this idea of, of being in a place that, that feels smaller than your ambitions, and yet you fear you'll never be able to actually get out. Um, Cut Bank itself is a, is a tiny town, but the, the movie a version of Cut Bank that we create is even smaller than the, the real cut bank. Uh, probably feels like there's only five or six hundred people who live there, more of a kind of last picture show town. And uh, yeah, it's about a guy who thinks, you know, can I ever get out of this place that feels frozen in time, uh, where, you know, the cars feel 20 years old and nobody has a cell phone and, and there's probably no cable TV. You know, can I get out of here? And, and then he sets some things in motion that, that don't go too well for him. When you were directing the, the the cast and the film you know what's the kind of a process that you go through because you know again like we mentioned they're not you know uh, they're not greenhorns these guys are you know well experienced in the craft do you you mentioned you just kind of let him go did you offer some suggestions absolutely you know um i did both of those things i i let him go and i offered suggestions and um, the great thing about those experienced actors is they, they always come in and make a bold choice and, and find something new and original there, and, and I try to encourage that as much as I can. And even the young actors were, were equally as uh, sort of adventurous and came in with a strong point of view. Um, 
in, in general, I believe, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the rule of improv, which <laughs> is yes and. Uh, you, know, you never say no in an improv comedy exercise because then the whole thing shuts down and you say, you know, I'm a fish, and the other guy says, no, you're not. There's no more comedy to be had. Yeah. And I sort of feel like that rule applies to uh, directing actors and working with artists of all types, whether it's cinematographers or production designers. It's always better to, to, to create a, a, an environment where where things are, are possible, where ideas are encouraged, and then you can pick you know, the ones that rise to the top as being the, the best ideas, nurture those, and, and continue building on them. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, it's fantastic that you know, they're able to, they come from this background, and you know, they just went with it. You know, when, you know tell me if, if they happen to mention, and, but also what, draw you, what drew you to the, uh, to the storyline, and if they happen to mention what you know, drew them to the film. What drew me to the story was this interesting combination of tones and genre. It's a, it's a little bit of a black comedy. It's a, it's a little bit of a thriller. It's a little bit of a drama. It's all these different things, uh, which, I, which I really responded to. It felt original and felt new, uh, and yet it also, um, uh, I'm a big fan of thrillers, and so it, it allowed me to, uh, to create some suspense, which I love to do. And, and so that's why I was drawn to it. It's a great character piece, the chance to work with wonderful actors and, and build this town and all of these strange denizens of the town. That was incredibly rewarding. And then the actors came to it from, you know, from I assume from, from different points of view. Um, Malkovich came on uh, very early, as I mentioned, and, and in part because he actually knew the real town of Cutbank, Montana. He had put himself through school <laughs> during the summer as being a volunteer fireman just outside of Cutbank, Montana and Glacier National Park. So he, he knew the area personally. Bruce Dern had almost made a movie there in the 70s that got shut down right before shooting. So people had a kind of You know, that's amazing. Like you mentioned, there's a small town, and the couple of the big names had an odd connection. That 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 must have been an odd feeling that they knew the town. Yeah, and Billy Bob even mentioned that he's you know very close to Robert Duvall has been in his films, and 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 Duvall had said when when he told him uh, that when Billy told him that he was coming up to make a movie about Cupcake Montana, and Duvall said, oh, "I know that place. I've ridden horses there." <laughs> so you know, it, it, more than just Malkovich and Dirt, everyone seems to have this connection. So. <laughs> And after we wrapped, Malkovich actually took his, his wife and daughter on a little road trip because we were only a few hours north of the actual cut bank. And he drove down there and he went to the town and he, and he had lunch at the local diner and took some pictures with the, the people there. And, and so he revisited his, his youth in, in the real cut bank. <laughs> well, what, well, what a great story to, um, to have. That, that's a great panel discussion right there. Definitely. <laughs> yep. Well, wanted to ask you about um, you know direction. You you, you did you know, television, theater, uh, movies. Uh, different approach for each, since each has its uh, you know its own little nuances. Or is it you know your basic style that you approach uh, everything? Yeah, I think my I think my my style remains the same because it's it's sort of an anti style. My style is to tell the story as best I can, and whether that story is a comedy or a drama, whether it's on stage or on film. Uh, it's just about telling the story and bringing that world to life. So I think the same tools are used in all of those different places, um, even though there are subtle differences technically, obviously, in how you, you stage something for theater or stage something for film. Uh, the guy who got me started in this business, uh, Ed Swick, uh, was really my, my teacher and my mentor in, in learning how to direct television and film. And, and he said to me very early on, he said, you know, it's just like theater. It's just instead of one proscenium, you have a thousand proscenium. I've always sort of wow. stuck with that and, and used that sort of as a, as, a, as a way to understand how you make a film. It's just yeah. a bunch of different vantage points on the same event, and film allows you to kind of change your point of view uh, and use that, that change in point of view to help tell the story. Wow. So was it when he told you that early on, did it just stick with you and you, and you brought it forward? Oh, definitely, yeah. It was, it was, wow. you know, I was trying to figure out how to make that adjustment from, from what I knew about theater to... to what I needed to know about television and film, it was, it was definitely Swick's advice along the way that, uh, that helped me um, make that adjustment in terms of not just how you shoot something visually, but how you stage for the camera, and also what, what you need in order to understand the movement of a set. You know, there's, there's a lot of time and motion involved in, in making 
a film or a TV show and trying to get what you need in the time that you have to finish while the light is the, the way you want it, uh, you know, before the night comes or before you lose the nighttime, all of those things requires a <laughs> kind of planning and an approach that, that I had to learn over the years. Wow, amazing, amazing. You, know, you, you could see by, you know, the work alone. You know how wonderful it was. Uh, now, now, let me ask: Do, do you have a preference uh, each of each one, or is it just equally satisfying whenever you get to direct uh, either one? Uh, I think I've, I, I value uh, what each of them offers when I'm doing the other one. So, <laughs> you know, when I'm doing theater, and I think Gosh, I really want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's much more exciting with a camera up there, <laughs> or if I could, uh, you know, or this process is taking too long to get where I need to go in theater. I wish I, this were going faster, like television. You know, and then I'm doing a television show, and I'm thinking, "Gosh, it's going too fast." I wish I could have the slower pace of a <laughs> of theater. You know, and when you get to get to film, you're like, "Wow, I'm making all this stuff for the first time." It sure would be nice if I were just doing an episode of Mad Men where it was all worked out. You know, we knew what we were doing. Um, so every one of them, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side of the uh, of the fence. But I I certainly love being able to work in all of them, and 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 being able to do. Uh, and uh, you know, theater, film, television uh, is it's a dream, really. And so to be able to go back and forth is wonderful. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's great. Yeah, the grass is always greener. That, that that's great. You know, yeah. you know, you know. I'm, I'm curious. You know, like you mentioned, John Malkovich. You know, he's a theater guy. You know. Yeah. You know, and it's great that you have the same background. You know, when he was acting, and when some of the other actors were, you know, doing their craft, could you see the the theater actor come out versus the movie star, or was it just all seamless? John Malkovich is—he's a master. Yeah, the guy is master of anything that he does. You know, he's directed films, he's produced films, he's acted on stage, he's acted in operas. He, uh, he's done everything. Um, now he's on television, Crossbones. Um, <laughs> he also, he, he's, he's a brilliant actor. He, he, he's, he's adventurous, um, but at the same time, he's also incredibly technically proficient. I believe when he directed the film that he made with Javier Bardem, he actually photographed the whole movie. He was the, he was the camera operator. So he understands the world, uh, wow. all of the different jobs in, in, the, in the film uh, that, are, that are at work. So he'd come onto the set and he would see immediately what kind of lens we had on and see where the mark was and he would understand exactly what the shot was, how wide it was, how tight it was, what we were doing in the shot. He would see where the dolly track went. You didn't have to tell him a thing. And the minute I would go up to say, hey, this is what this shot is, he would say, yeah, yeah, I've got it. He, he knew exactly what was happening. So he is, he is a master craftsman as well as a, as a master actor. And I think that's true for, for my experience with Billy Bob and Bruce Dern and all those guys. They, they, they know what's happening on the set um, better than, than anybody. Wow, that, that, that must be amazing. That, you know, amazing that they know exactly that. The, obviously, the conversations were short because they knew exactly what they were <laughs> needing. Yeah, I mean, they're short when they need to be and, and, and longer when they need to be. There's more to discuss about script and stuff. And then we certainly made little changes and tweaks along the way based on their notes. Um, but, but, yeah, they definitely they had a shorthand for what was happening on that film set. They knew what was up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can just, I can just imagine the conversation. Uh, we're doing this shot, John Malkovich. Uh, this, this, this lens, this mark. Yeah. Okay. I'm good. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Action. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that can, that can be as, it can be as quick as that. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that, that's great. That's a great behind the scenes. Another great panel uh, question discussion there. And, you know, yeah. did, did, did want to ask you just, uh, just a couple more questions. Um, sure. I know you also have a theater company here in uh, Los Angeles, the Black Dahlia. That must be satisfying to be able to do, um, you know, plays emerging and established here and introducing it to the, you know, Angelinos and everyone. It is. It's very fun. I, I it's, it's a playground away from, from film and television, even some of the bigger theater stuff that I do. It's a chance to really experiment, to, uh, to work with great writers, both, as you said, both new uh, emerging writers and also established writers. We, uh, we've been around for almost 14 years producing new work, and uh, we're just about to move into our new home, which is a, a theater that Charlie Chaplin started in the 40s, which is just near Paramount Studios, and we're, we're renovating it now and bringing everything up to code and uh, should be producing new work there in the fall. And it actually turns out that that, that space that, that we bought and, and that we're renovating right now is where Billy Bob Thornton first introduced his character from Sling Blade. Wow. Back in the day, he was doing a one-man show, and that was one of the characters in the one-man show. So uh, there's a nice bit of connection there, too. Yeah, talk about that six degrees. Wow. Yeah, I think we're down to one now. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, and how about um, future projects? You got something else coming out uh, at the end of the year, this year? Yeah, well, I've got Fargo airing right now, the last two episodes of Fargo. All the final finale is coming up this Tuesday. And then uh, season 10 of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which I direct and also work on as a producer. And that's uh, coming up. Um, we're just uh, finishing our, uh, our shooting right now for season 10. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's what's happening right now. Last question. Just want to know about um, social media for the film, for yourself, upcoming projects. Where you know, even the theater company. Definitely. Well, the theater company is on Twitter. We don't use it as much as we should, and also on <laughs> Facebook. Um, I myself uh, am on Twitter. Uh, I don't use it as much as I should. I'm a bit of a dinosaur when it comes to all of that, and I've, I've avoided Facebook, but I <laughs> should eventually join and, we're, and you know join this century. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure that others. I know that you know Teresa and Liam. And, uh, some of the other cast are, are quite active on social media, and so I'm sure they're they're um, you know doing their part to share the good news. Um, and we will we will try as a collective group to stay as busy as we can on it. Fantastic, Matt. Yeah, you know, thanks for taking the time. Wow, what what a what a great film, great cast, and and continued success to you. Well, thank you, thank you for the time. It's a pleasure to chat with you today. How's everything going this evening? Very exciting, yeah. What a, what a dream cast. I was so lucky to get uh, these guys to come together and make this film. Uh, they're, they're incredibly talented, and I've been admiring them from afar for a long time. It's great to admire them close up now. You know, I talked to Oliver and Michael, and they're saying that this is their, going to be their first time they're going to be screening it. Do you think uh, they're going to be in for a surprise? Something different from the script at all? No, I don't think so. You know, they should hopefully see what they remember shooting. Um, I don't think I put anything on the cutting room floor there, so they should not be shocked. Yeah, right, 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 good. They're like, what, what happened? I didn't do that. Yeah, right, I know. Hopefully not. Yeah. You, you know, that's an interesting question. You know, have you ever done that? You know, told the actor, hey, this is the story, but then change it on them? Oh, not intentionally, no, but we, we did have a couple of, char of characters in the film uh, you know, that didn't make it into the final cut, so I did have to let them know that, sadly, their terrific work didn't make it, but when you're, when you're putting together a film, that post-production period is almost like rewriting a film, and you start to change the story, you move things around, and sometimes not everybody makes it. Yeah, the editing floor for a lot of them, right? Yeah, it happens. It's, you know, Kevin Costner and the big chill. You yeah, know, that's there right. Are, there are a lot of good examples, so yeah, right. Yeah. Congratulations on everything. Thank you very much. It's terrific to see you in person. Thank you.